So in the last class we learned about World War I. Now we're going to learn about the interwar years, so the years between World War I and World War II. Uh, what we're going to talk about today specifically is several of the major revolutions that happened around the world, the first in Russia, the second in China, and the third in India. So we have three daily objectives for today. Number one, list the leaders of major revolutions across the world. Two, explain how Russia became a communist country. And three, explain how India gained independence from Great Britain. So, let's start with the Russian Revolution. Russia was the backward country of Europe. Its nickname was the Old Man of Europe. It dragged behind technologically um, in Europe. It had lots of people, but they were largely uneducated. Um, you had large, large, large population of peasants. Um, the Industrial Revolution did uh, happen much, much later in Russia. Uh, remember that Russia did not end serfdom until 300 years after Europe. Russia dragged behind. Now, until 1917, Russia was ruled by a czar, which is their word for a king. There's one such czar over here on the right. Um, and the czar had all power. Russia was an absolute monarchy. It was really one of only a handful of absolute monarchies still left in Europe in the 20th century. Now, Russia industrialized like other, other European countries, and when it did, this fueled the growth of a working class, just like it did in England, just like it did in Germany. So for the first time, people are working in factories, they make a wage, and you have the growth of this different thing called the working class that had not been around before. Along with their growth came their discontent. People were unhappy by the working con conditions that the Industrial Revolution brought about. The difference between Russia and, say, England is that Russia remembers an absolute monarchy, not a democracy. So in England, when you have people who are unhappy, they can go and they can take out their rage by voting. And they can maybe make a change in their country. You can't in a country like Russia, which is an absolute monarchy. The czar makes the rules. He does not care if you are unhappy. And ultimately, that is why we have a violent revolution in Russia and not all of the other countries that experienced the Industrial Revolution. Now, there's a guy by the name of Vladimir Lenin. He is the gentleman on the right. He was a follower of Karl Marx. Remember Karl Marx? He wrote the Communist Manifesto. And as a follower of Karl Marx, he, and as a native Russian, wanted to bring communism to Russia. The Tsar did not like this. The Tsar kicks Vladimir Lenin out of Russia, and Vladimir Lenin goes to Germany. The Germans are happy to have Vladimir Lenin, where they house him and keep him fed and happy, until the right moment. And that right moment was right in the middle of World War I. They send Vladimir Lenin on a train car back to Russia, secretly, and he begins fomenting rebellion against the Tsar. Ultimately, Vladimir Lenin succeeds. Some four million Russians are going to die in World War I. The Russian economy is under intense strain. They do not have the, 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 the guns or the ammunition to, to continue to wage the war. The Tsar does not want to surrender. Vladimir Lenin poses an alternative solution. Put me in power, bring communism into power, and things will be better. The Tsar is overthrown, he is assassinated. The Communist Party, led by Vladimir Lenin, assume control of the country. A very intense civil war breaks out between the old nobility and the new Communist Party and the new Russian army. Now, Lenin is going to die in 1922. He is not charged for very long. And he's replaced by Joseph Stalin. Stalin means man of steel. And he had, Joseph Stalin had total control of Russia by 1929. Joseph Stalin is going to be around for a long time, into the mid-50s. So not only is he going to have experience in World War I, but he's going to make it through all of World War II. And he is ultimately going to bring the atom bomb to the Soviet Union, but that's a little bit later. So Russia is renamed the Soviet Union, or USSR. Uh, I use those two names pretty much interchangeably, but they are not exactly the same. Under Joseph Stalin, the USSR, Russia is going to become a totalitarian state, or an authoritarian state. These, are, these words basically mean the same thing. 
Stalin has total control. This is not all that different from the Tsar's absolute monarchy before. The people are comfortable with this arrangement. Therefore, they allow it. In China, remember that China has suffered greatly under European powers as a result of imperialism. The country had been split up among the different European countries. Each country had its own little chunk. Remember that the British forced China to import opium, which had a devastating effect on the country. Lots of unemployed, lots of, lots of dead, lots of addicts. Not a great time for China. Now, the last Chinese emperor is overthrown in 1911 by the Chinese Nationalist Party. Nationalism made its way around the world, even to China. And the Chinese Nationalist Party are going to overthrow the emperor. And they're going to try and make China a republic. This lasts a couple years. But by 1916, China was ruled by local warlords. So the country had, been, had largely been split up and you had provincial governors or their own little kings. Uh, if you remember the Warring States period, we learned about that back in Unit 1. Very similar. This happens to China quite a bit. Now, in 1921, the Chinese Communist Party was formed in an effort to reunite the country. In the eyes of a lot of Chinese, nationalism had destroyed the country. Literally, it had broken it into pieces. And communism seemed like a good alternate, alternate path. Mao Zedong, the guy on the right, was originally a librarian. But he led the Communist Party movement in China. Unlike in Russia where communism forms around the working class. And this is really Karl Marx's idea that, that revolution will come from the working class as a result of poor working conditions. Mao Zedong sees the poor working conditions in rural peasants, the rural peasant farmers. And this is where he really roots his version of Chinese communism. And the rural peasants, not in the urban working class. This is very important. Now, Russia, already a communist country, lent support to the Communist Party in China. They are sending money, they are sending soldiers, they are sending guns. And by 1930, China had once again descended into civil war. This time, the Communists versus the Nationalists. 1937, Japan invades China. What a lot of people do not realize is that World War II technically starts with the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. Uh, long before the war started in Europe. Now, as a result, the communists and the nationalists come together and agree to suspend the civil war. They begin working together to try and kick the Japanese out of China. We will talk about World War II in the next day or so. In India, remember that India was conquered and colonized by the British. Remember, they were growing the British, the British rubber, tea, opium, all sorts of raw materials that the British needed to uh, continue their industrial economy. Many wealthy Indians traveled to England, were educated there, learned about democracy, and then returned to India. They did not like the way that India was going because they had learned about nationalism, and they brought nationalism to India. They wanted India to be for Indians, not for the British. So, the Indians that were educated in Great Britain, back in England, would be the first Indian nationalists. They are going to be the ones that lead the independence movement in India. Now, the most important of these nationalists is Gandhi. So he's going to be their leader. Gandhi was a trained English attorney prior to heading the Indian Revolution. So this guy is 100%. Is He's well-educated in European ways of thinking. He is legally trained. He knows the laws. He understands the type of military power that Great Britain holds. This is not just some educated guy from nowhere. He is going to come back to India, see the devastation the British have brought, and he is going to want to change India. So prior revolutions in India had failed because the British army was capable of quickly putting down revolts. The British army is the most powerful force in the world at this point. Gandhi knew that. Gandhi knew that. And he decided 
to engage in a strategy known as nonviolence. So he is going to use peaceful protest to try and get independence for India. So for example, you've got a lot of Indian workers that say they work on British owned farms, tea farms. This upsets Gandhi. He wants to have a protest, so he goes to the farms and he orders all of the Indian farmers that are working the British tea farm to stop working. Now, obviously, the British aren't going to like this. In fact, they're going to not like it so much. They're going to send soldiers, and the soldiers are going to beat the Indian protesters. But what Gandhi knew was that all of these protests would be captured via pictures, via newspapers, and it would make its way back to Europe. And he knew that the people in Europe would not be okay with the way that Indians were being treated. Gandhi's ideas of peaceful protest, his idea of civil disobedience, cost Great Britain a lot of money. It also cost them a lot of political capital. The British government is looking bad at home, and they don't like this. The protests work. They worked. Without firing a shot, India is going to gain a limited form of self-government in 1935. This is right before the outbreak of World War II. And this is because of Gandhi's protest movements. This is because Gandhi was smart enough to know that if he cost the British enough money, if it was not worth their time to stay in India, if he made the British look bad on the world stage, he knew they would leave. And they did. They do finally leave in 1947, shortly after World War II. India gains full independence. Answer your daily objectives.